to the law. And the law is going to come to you from the judge through what are known as jury instructions. It's going to be a packet like this. Um, you'll get a copy of it, so don't worry about writing things down verbatim. And um, things like the photos and the evidence, um, you'll be able to take back with you. You can't take back firearms or ammunition. And if you wanted to see one of the videos, well, yeah, one of the videos or the audio, you have to come back, come back out here, but you're more than welcome to. So take as much time as you would ever you need. You've also heard in this trial that there have been different statements and transcripts made. Unfortunately, those aren't going to be able to go back with you for what is known as hearsay. So before going over the law, So before going over the law, it's important to know what exactly the state has charged Tom Lewis with. Tom Lewis had no intent to kill Mary Knowlton. He didn't want this to happen, and the state is not alleging that he did. But in jury selection, everyone agreed that the law applies equally to everyone. So even though there was no intent on his part that Mary Knowlton be shot, he is still responsible for exposing her to harm. There was a continuing course of conduct that led to the tragedy on August 9th. But there was one main inexcusable component. And that was the fact that a real firearm was used in that scenario. And you heard many witnesses say a blank gun but make no mistake, a blank gun is a gun that also fires live ammunition. And Tom Lewis knew that, and he allowed Lee Cole on many occasions to use that firearm in these citizen-type scenarios. A firearm is something that is inherently dangerous. It is something that causes death, and that is everyone's common sense, they know that. And the easiest way that Tom Lewis could have avoided all of this, avoided what happened to Mary Knowlton on August 9th, was to not try to make such an impact, as he stated in his statement, but to actually provide the safety for all of those citizens that were there. And that means not give one of the people involved in the shoot-don't-shoot scenario a real firearm. And Lee Cole is absolutely at fault. That's why he's charged with manslaughter. But Tom Lewis also had a duty that day, a duty to all of those citizens there, and that was to make sure that they were safe. But instead, he showed a disregard for the safety of everyone, for human life, and especially Mary Knowlton, who was randomly selected that day. It was her life that was taken. So these jury instructions, like I said, are going to come in a packet, and I want to go over a few of them with you. The first instruction is the actual culpable negligence instruction. Everyone see? Okay. This is the law. This is what the state has to prove. And as you can see, culpable negligence has two elements that the state has to prove. And the first one is that the defendant, Tom Lewis, exposed Mary Knowlton to personal injury. So how have we proved that to you? Again, a real firearm, something we all know is inherently deadly, was used. And there was no reason for that to be used. There was no reason that a simunition weapon couldn't have been used by Lee Cole, except it made more of an impact. They switched from simunitions to blanks because it gave a louder effect. They have simunition weapons, and we know this. And very easily, this could have been fixed, but it wasn't. And Tom Lewis knew that this was happening. You heard from one of the defense witnesses, James Nichols, 
who is a canine officer, and he's done over 2,000 um, demonstrations and has never had a safety officer and has never had a problem, and, and everything's been safe. I want to make it clear that a canine demonstration is not a shoot, don't shoot scenario. It is not two individuals with weapons firing at each other. So maybe you don't need a safety officer for canine demonstrations. Unfortunately, that's not what we're dealing with here. Mary Knowlton had never held a firearm before. No one knew that. No one asked that. She had no protective gear. And she walked into that scenario completely So this, this is how we know that she was exposed to culpable negligence. Tom Lewis knew everything that was going on. You saw he was standing right there. He was involved, didn't have protection, never asked if she had held a firearm, knew Lee Cole was using a gun, a real revolver, and did nothing. So now the second element is he did so through culpable negligence. What is culpable negligence? And this is quite a lengthy instruction, and if, kind of, if you kind of break it down, it'll probably be easier to understand. Culpable negligence. Each of us has a duty to act reasonably towards others. If there's a violation of that duty without any conscious intention to harm, that violation is negligence. That is not what we are dealing with here. Culpable negligence is an entire want, meaning lack of care as to raise a presumption of a conscious indifference to consequences. Or you could look at which shows wantonness or recklessness or a grossly careless disregard for the safety and welfare of the public. Or show an indifference to the rights of others as is equivalent to an intentional violation of such rights. You might read some of those and say, some of those don't apply. But I guarantee you that the reckless disregard for human life for the dangerous effects that she was exposed to, those apply. Now, Tom Lewis is charged with exposure, and the defense is making the argument that he wasn't, this wasn't his thing, you know, he wasn't in charge of this, he's just the face of the office. Catherine Peterson, John Pryor, and John Wright told you about his involvement. Specifically, the shoot, don't shoot scenario, he is the one narrating to everyone. He also takes time with Mary Knowlton, as we know, and goes over this ammunition. But he's not involved, he's just the face. Here he is at the static displays. Welcome to the chief. Again, at the static displays. Addressing the group. But he's not involved in this. He's just the face. He's hands-on with Mary Golden. You also heard, or actually going back to um, Mr. Pryor. Mr. Pryor, he took the stand the other day and he told you that I saw a sign in the front of the police department and the defense said, was it about a safety zone, um, something like that. And he goes, no, that's not the sign that I saw. It said that this is the safest place in the community. And then the defense brought Gloria's panic in today to say, no, this is the only sign we have. If you're judging credibility based on the sign, it makes no sense whether or not what sign he saw. John Pryor has nothing to gain from anything. His testimony is, this is what I saw, this is what I heard, and he doesn't have any interest in the outcome of this. Now, you've heard testimony from John Wright that it was Tom Lewis that personally invited the chamber to that Citizens Academy. It wasn't Woodard or Salzman or Katie Heck. It was Lewis. 
In the past shoot, don't shoot scenarios, which he said were about 10 times, he couldn't quite say in his statement, everything went fine. But more importantly, he had always been involved in those situations. But now this scenario he's not involved in, he always has been in the past. He was also involved in the development and execution of this scenario. And there were witnesses, um, Captain Woodard, uh, Captain Giaschini, who told you, yes, my understanding was that from Tom Lewis saying that they're going to be a shoot, don't shoot scenario, came off YouTube from somewhere in Arizona. They also told you that it could have been that Chief Arnell, who was the chief at the time, and when Tom Lewis was the captain, told him, this is what I want you to do. And then Tom developed this. He rolled this out because he was the operations captain at the time. And we know from the testimony that the shoot, don't shoot scenario was always handled by the operations side of things. Captain Giustini said that that night, Lewis was the facilitator. Katie had organized it, but Lewis was the facilitator. Not Woodard, not Salzman, not Heck, not anyone else that the defense claims was involved in this or responsible for this. There were two people between the facilitating and the organization, Katie Heck and Tom Lewis. Katie Heck wasn't there that night. So that leaves Tom Lewis in charge. So then the argument from the defense goes, well, yes, but he delegates. He can delegate um, assignments to his officers and they need to be filed, followed. I agree, if you're gonna delegate, then they should be followed. But if you're gonna delegate, you better know who you delegated to. He had no idea who he allegedly delegated things to that night. He maybe assumed things or presumed things, but that is acting very dangerous and very recklessly. Another thing that I found very interesting was that when it came down to it, I believe Lieutenant Salzman blamed Captain Woodard. Woodard blamed no one, but then he blamed himself. But then when Mr. Domerick got back on direct to question him, he then again wouldn't blame himself because it wasn't his fault. Um, Lieutenant Lipker blamed everyone. Um, Cheschini had no idea who to blame because no one was ever assigned to it. But he delegates and people follow the rules. Nobody knows who he delegated to. It was also clear from every witness on the stand that no safety officer was ever designated. Maybe Tom Lewis assumed someone would be the safety officer, but that's not good enough. No one was designated as the safety officer. So Lee Cole's gun was never checked. I also there's this argument that, well, even if they would have checked, even if they would have, there's no way to tell the difference between those. There's no way that, and just by looking at these, we would have been able to tell that this is a wad cutter. I don't buy that. You got to see these, you got to hold them. First of all, you can feel the weight difference. And when you look at the wad cutter, there's a projectile right there. It's not cardboard, there's not wax. Even if you don't know what a wad cutter is, you should be able to look at it and say, mm, something's not right here. We didn't even take that opportunity because no one checked the gun. And clearly with the blank, you see the recessed area where there's then cardboard. Or like Gene Sim said, sometimes it's a waxy substance. But if somebody looked at the two of these, if they had taken the time, they would have noticed that there was a projectile in here. Now, another instruction that you're going to get is what's called plea of not guilty, reasonable doubt, and burden of proof. Okay, so in order for the state to overcome the presumption of innocence, the state has to prove that there is no reasonable doubt left. 
And what I want to say is, in jury selection, there were terms like, well, if it's reasonably possible, well, if it's reasonably possible, if it's possibly reasonable, this is the statement. Reasonable doubt. What it says is, it's not a mere possible doubt. So don't get confused with phrases that have been thrown around at this point. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible, speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Don't, you can't speculate that Tom Lewis delegated that night because there's no testimony, there's no evidence that he did. In fact, everyone said, I don't know, wasn't me. I think it was this person. You're going to get another instruction about weighing the evidence. So this is your opportunity then. It's kind of just some helpful hints that the judge is going to give you about, well, when we're actually looking at these witnesses, how do we judge whether or not they're being credible or truthful? And you can consider, did the witness seem to have an opportunity to see and know the things about which the witness testified? Were they there? Did we believe what they saw that was actually there? Did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Some did. Some could not remember. Um, some just didn't know. Was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? I think it was pretty evident that every Punta Gorda Police Department officer that took the stand was very unhappy to be here. They don't want to testify against their boss and their friend. And Mr. Domrick and I would ask questions, and we had to pull the responses out of them that they had previously given when sworn to tell the truth, because they didn't want to. People started backing off their statements. And it was then very interesting when Mr. Romine got up and could basically just tell them the evidence that he wanted, and all they would have to say is yes. Yes, yes, yes. But with us, they wouldn't do it. So you get to consider, was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? You get to consider that when judging whether or not someone is credible. David Lipker was the first Punta Gorda police um, officer that testified. He was there that night, but he was working as the watch commander, so he wasn't at all involved in the actual academy. In fact, he actually thought sins were still being used in the academy in the uh, Citizens Academy, in the shoot-don't-shoot shoot scenario. So when he heard the gunshots, he immediately knew something was wrong. He told you that he has been, obviously, friends with Tom Lewis for two decades. They have a very close relationship. But he would not answer my questions. When I asked him, well, what is a safety officer? And he responds, well, what do you mean? What do I mean what a safety officer is? You're in law enforcement, you're a firearms instructor, and you can't tell me what a safety officer is? When asked who was in charge of the scenario, I can't answer that. He told you he doesn't know who's in charge at all. He did, though, however, give us a very thorough explanation of safety checks. The process gone through, keeping things in the armory, having somebody double check your work. Very thorough process that they could have used that night. You also heard from Shane Chetikowski, who <coughs> said, um, I just assumed someone else had checked. Jason Cheschini, who is currently the interim chief, but he was a captain at the time. When the concept of, well, where did this scenario come from? I had to ask him two more times to tell me what he previously said in his sworn testimony. That yes, it was when Chief Arnell was there, but Tom Lewis was one of the facilitators that helped to roll it out. I had to ask him three times total in order to get the answer. He was the one that told us that the shoot, don't shoot scenario developed from the operations side. Again, who was the captain of operations when these rolled out? Tom Lewis. 
And he also talked to you about how there are, there are policies in place dealing with firearms. There's no policies in place to deal with a situation like this where you're going to use a firearm with a random citizen. But there's a policy um, in place, and it's the use of firearms. And I believe you'll get to read the policy, and it, it talks about when you should use deadly force against um, individuals when you're arresting them or in pursuit. And it also discusses when you should and shouldn't, uh, what ammunition you can, can't use, what firearms you can, can't use. But this is the closest thing we have to governing what happened on August 9th, a use of firearms policy. Brandon Angelini, he, this was his first Citizens Academy. In fact, he didn't even know that he did these there until that night. And he was part of the static display, and then he decided to stick around because he wanted to see what the actual scenario was like. He had no idea if uh, Cole's gun was ever checked. He no idea if there was a safety officer. And he assumed that Woodard checked because he had checked before something he had never said in his two previous sworn statements. And his explanation of checking Sims weapons when he's training with the SWAT team was fantastic. He told you how in one, one scenario they will line up and someone will go down the line both ways so you get double checked. And that's just for simunition weapons. He also told you about how you could have the firearms instructor sit there and literally pull every bullet out in order to examine it and then load it again. Those are really great safety checks that weren't used on August 9th. Now, <laughs> there was also this testimony and this back and forth about FDLE's curriculum and whether or not they're okay with blanks being used in role play. And Brandon Angelini is the one that brought that up, and he said, you know, I looked into it, and yes, it's, it's fine. And then I asked Gene Sims when he was on the stand. He's been the firearms instructor for 30 years at LCSO and the police academy. And he said, no, the, the curriculum does not say that you can use blank ammunition for role playing. So then Mr. Romine brought the manual of how to train people or how to train officers to be firearms instructors and how law enforcement officers in force on force scenarios can use blanks that is completely different than the curriculum for the cadets that are becoming police officers you heard from justin devolt and he was his role that night was to be a representative from the um, criminal investigation section. So during the tours, he was standing there in some of the pictures, and he's wearing a, a suit. He didn't check Cole's gun. Why would he? He had nothing to do with the shoot, don't shoot scenario. Why would he assume that he was supposed to be the one that checked it? Tom Lewis said, I, I thought he did. Well, where did that come from? There was no testimony or evidence as to why he thought Justin DeVault checked his firearm. Yeah, on the, the video you do see DeVault speaking with Lewis outside. You also saw many people speaking with Lewis outside. Or, I'm sorry, speaking with um, Lee Cole outside. But so that from that you're supposed to assume that DeVault checked the firearm? You heard from Jeff Woodard. Um, he recently left the Panagorda Police Department, and he denies multiple times in his sworn statement that he was responsible to check Lee Cole's gun. It was not his job. And then, when he took the stand yesterday, or it could have been Tuesday, it kind of changed. Yeah, I, I, I should have checked it. Well, it's, it's interesting. One of your closest friends is on trial, you take a road trip with him to go see his attorney prior to testifying, and now all of a sudden you have some responsibility for it when you've never said that before. You get to consider that when judging credibility. Another interesting part is Officer Woodard told you I was um, Mary Knowlton's handler. I was about 
they have an inhaler or someone who, if something goes wrong, you know, they can quickly jump in. They can, um, you know, if a, a person doesn't really have firearms experience, they can quickly jump in and save the situation. He was about 10 or 15 feet away, according to him. This is water over here. You see Mary Olton walking up. He's back here behind this tree. Ten to fifteen feet away, he's her handler. He wasn't her handler. Do you know who's a lot closer? Who's behind these people? Tom Lewis. He's 10 to 15 feet away. Woodard's not. Christopher Salzman. Again, another great friend of Tom Lewis. He took the same trip to Clearwater with him. He gave testimony, sworn testimony, the night of into the early morning hours the next day, that the scenario was supposed to play out by scaring Mary Knowlton and to see how she would react. So Lee Cole was supposed to point a firearm in her direction and fire it a few times. Well, now his testimony has changed and that's not really what he meant. Katie Heck. Katie Heck was the community services supervisor the media relation, the PR person, um, any interaction with the community, she organizes it and you know, gets, every, gets everyone involved. Katie Heck wasn't there that night. Katie Heck has never had anything to do with the shoot, don't shoot scenario. Katie Heck thought they were still using some munition, some munition weapons. Katie Heck is not responsible to get a safety officer. She was never told that. Who would have told her that? Maybe Tom Lewis should have told her that. Her direct supervisor. You also heard testimony about Katie Heck giving Lee Cole the ammunition, not knowing what it was. At the end of the day, that ammunition is what ended up in Lee Cole's revolver. But there could have been a lot of stops to that. It only took one person to open up Lee Cole's revolver, take one of the bullets out and look at it. Tom Lewis, you saw his statement, and there's no doubt that he was very upset about this. Again, this is not something that he wanted to happen. But his description of this as supposed to be a fun and interactive scenario fell really short when there's no safety precautions taken. Mary Knowlton was a sitting duck walking into that situation. When asked who was in charge of the scene, that's a great question. Mean, that's a great question. In the past, it's always been you. You're, you helped develop these, facilitate these, and now that's a great question. We then heard yesterday from a few um, deputies from the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office, Chandler, Prevett, and Gilmer. And the point of their testimony was to say, well, back in July, Lee Cole, who was training with them, participated in a training event, um, and they, they did some practicing beforehand, and he had some new ammunition on the table, and he loaded one, and he shot it into the ground, and the grass moved. So it must have been wad cutters. And no one told Tom Lewis that, hey, the ground moved, he's got real firearms, or he's got real ammunition in his firearm. First of all, no one said, yes, they were wad cutters. I identified them right here. They're wad cutters. The closest we got was from Gilmer, I believe, who said, yeah, I think it had a, a blue top on it. It looked blue to me. Well, if you want to look at a picture, yes, maybe it does look blue. It's not blue. And when asked, well, why do you, you think the ground moved? He goes, well, I thought it was the concussion. Because the gas escaping from the firearm when it's pointed down at the ground is going to move grass or dirt. Prevet, he told you the, the ammunition that I saw 
It was loose in a cube, cube box. I asked him, I said, are you familiar with blazers? He said, yes. I said, well, were they blazers? He said, no. Remember, the blazers are the ones in the rectangular box. Those are the wad cutters. That was not the ammunition that he saw. Now, the blanks are in a cube box. And he said, I don't think they were Winchesters. But the blanks are in a cube. These are clearly not in a cube box. There was a, and he actually picked one up. And he said, I looked at it. They were definitely blanks. And we asked, have you ever seen wad cutters? Yes. Could they have been wad cutters? No, they're blanks. But the defense wants you to believe that those wad cutters were used that day. People knew about it. Tom, they should have told Tom Lewis about it. Well, FDLE went out there and searched for a very long time to try to find the projectiles from the wad cutters and found nothing. You heard from Gene Sims, and with his 30 plus years of firearms experience, I asked him, under what circumstances should you use or sanction the use of a real firearm in a scenario like this? And his answer was, never. Never. I don't need to. He's the one that described the bullets. He's the one that showed us they're, they're actually quite identifiable if someone would look. Um, he also ex um, explained to you the amount of safety precautions in place, again, with just the cadets at the academy. What has to be done in order to make sure that safety is in place? And those explanations for those safety precautions were in a controlled environment. And this is definitely not a controlled environment. They didn't do anything for Mary Nolan. Now, you're going to also see the verdict form. And it's really simple, and the judge will explain it to you. There's only two options, guilty or not guilty. And on the culpable negligence instruction, I don't want you to think I left anything out, at the bottom here, the negligent act or omission must have been uh -oh. must have been committed with an utter disregard for safety of others. Culpable negligence is consciously doing an act or following a course of conduct that the defendant must have known or reasonably should have known was likely to cause death or great bodily harm. Firearm is inherently a deadly weapon. So yes, he should know <coughs> that putting Mary Knowlton in that position with a real firearm, without designating someone as a safety officer, could lead to great, or is likely to cause death or great bodily harm. There was a lot of assumptions and presumptions and supposes that happened that night. And that's because Tom Lewis did not have the proper safety precautions present in order to not expose Mary Dolan to injury. Now, this idea of, well, if Lee Cole would have done what he was supposed to do and actually fired blanks and pointed it down, none of this would have happened. Well, <coughs> blanks. The reason you can't use blanks, or you shouldn't use blanks in a situation like this in a real firearm, is because guess what? They can be mistaken for a real live ammunition. <coughs> That's where everything went wrong. It was him, Tom Lewis, allowing that firearm to be used. Did the defense wish to make a closing argument? Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed. Uh, good morning. And again, um, thanks for waiting and considering everything that you hear here because obviously I have a lot to um, discuss with you about this. 
let's start with, with this right here. And again, these are the closing arguments. You guys heard all of the testimony. Okay, so if somebody comes up and makes an argument and says something to you that's not consistent with what the testimony was or what you heard, that's why you're the jury. That's why we have you here. Because a lot of the state's argument they just made are not actually accurate as to what was said. And I'll go over those things there. There's a lot of statements being made that are kind of this theory. Okay, well, the, the gun there's a theory that the gun is dangerous and this could happen and that could happen. But you are, as the jurors, required to follow what the law is. And you're also required to follow not what a theory is. This, this case isn't about, is it possible in some scenario that a gun that can load blanks and a uh, live bullet, in some scenario, under some particular circumstances, could end up hurting somebody? Yes. Guess what? There's something called a bowling ball. And in some scenario, when you use a bowling ball the way it's not supposed to be used, and you go stand over somebody, you drop it on their head, it can cause somebody to die also. There's a lot of things in life that if they're not done the right way, can kill us. Every time we step on a plane and we go up 35,000 feet in the air, is it possible when we're 35,000 feet in the air, is it possible that a plane could end up plummeting to the ground? Yes, it is. But why do we step on the plane? We step on the plane because it's not likely. Because we understand that the way it's supposed to work makes us comfortable to get into basically a cigar tube with wings on it and go fly 35,000 feet up into the air knowing that we're going to eventually come back down safely. Okay? So this concept, which has permeated this trial from the state's position the whole time, and raises these things to try and alarm you and say, well, these guns are, could be dangerous and do this. That is not what the law is in this case. This is not about, is it possible something could go wrong in any scenario? That's not what culpable negligence is about. So every time they go to argue those things, I'm going to try and steer you back to what you guys have sworn to follow and do. And that doesn't mean in this case, that there, if there's things that you see and you think, well, you know, this could be better or that could be better, that's okay. That's okay if you find something that way. I don't, when I go over this thing, I don't think anything as to the chief is going to fall that. But even if you did, you said, well, you know what, maybe this should have been said different or whatever, that's okay. Because what does this law talk about? All right? And instead of, I'm kind of old school, so. I'm bring the easel up here and hope this thing doesn't go, I know it won't go out. Um, so let's go over what the law is. Let's go over what you're really being asked to decide here. Instead of theories and alarming and all that, let's talk about the law. And it's interesting because, you know, the state talked to you about what the law is. Um, but let's actually apply what happened here with, with the, the fact. This is what you're going to be given right here. And the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt these two elements. The first element that they must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that it was Tom Lewis that exposed Mary Knowlton to it. Tom Lewis. As if somehow Lee Cole's conduct in this is like, well, you know, it's just another issue. That's just something that Tom Lewis is exposing this because He's the chief, and he kind of knows these things are done and everything. Tom Lewis didn't expose Mary Knowlton to anything. Lee Cole did. Because, as you know, there is no dispute in this case. No matter how it's turned or talked or discussed, there's no dispute in this case that this happened for two reasons, and both of those broke the policies of his agency. That every witness that was up there that was asked this question, did he have a right to expect his officers to follow the law? The answer is yes. So again, back to the plane thing. Can a plane go down, etc.? Yes. Can something happen wrong if somebody's using a gun that could also perhaps put in something? It could if they break the law, if they break policy, if we think somehow for some reason we have some idea that they're going to do something wrong with it. But the same reason we get on the plane is because we know it's not likely to happen. It's the same reason when you're setting these up and you go, well, if it's used properly, it's safe. And in fact, their own witness said that. Mr. Sims, when I asked him, if he used the blanks they gave him and pointed the gun in the direction he's supposed to do it, that every witness asked that told you, you don't ever do this. 
Even their witness. I put it up on the video and said, is that the right way to point this gun? Who they called, who they brought in, the friend of their boss, which we'll talk about that in a minute. But he even said, yeah, if you do that, it doesn't. Now, did he say it to me like this? Okay, because I agree with the state on these things about, was the witness straightforward? Was the witness straightforward? Here's a real simple question to Mr. Sims. Mr. Sims, if, if Lee Cole had used the blanks he was given, that the agency provided him to use, and he pointed the gun down the safe manner you're describing that you know that all law enforcement officers are trained to. I even brought in for you his trainer at the canine of Charlotte County Sheriff's Office that said, we teach down. Okay? Brought in the people he works with that said, we teach down. And their, their, their person that teaches says, we teach down. We don't do this. You have the box. Look at the box on the side of the Winchester. Do not point it at a person or an animal. Why does Winchester put that? Because they know blanks are going to be used in proximity to people and animals. They make these. They know what they're for. Demonstrations, presentations, the dogs. How much evidence did you hear? And that's why this is, again, goes to um, Lewis's intent. Have you heard anything at all about any of these people that ran all these presentations with guns that can fire blanks and could fire a live round if an officer mistakenly put it in there? Was there any evidence at all for any of these things that those incidences resulted in a criminal charge? No. No. It's common. That's what they do. Katie Heck herself. How's this for some piece of evidence coming out in this trial? You always learn little new things as they come out here. How's this? She took her children to one of these public demonstrations that had live guns shooting blanks. And we're supposed to think that she doesn't know there's any safety issues that go with that. She put her children next to it. And this whole thing about, well, but if a civilian's in it, that's the... No, it's not. People are people. You, you think for a minute that the safety rules are different for a person you're training to be an officer? That FDLE says? Uh, you can certainly use blanks in role playing. And those are for people you're training. Which, by the way, on that point of Mr. Sam, um, I have a very, very different recollection of his testimony. You must rely on yours. But I asked him specifically. He said the whole curriculum doesn't mention role play. They asked him that, trying to impeach Angelini, who had said to them, you deposed me and questioned me about this. I didn't know it, so I went and looked it up. And here I am. And yes, it does say that. I have been taught that. So they asked Mr. Sims, well, Say role playing in there at all? No. Not in it, no. Not in the curriculum. Not in the curriculum. Remember, I got up and I said, well, curriculum's a big word, right? It's a big word. And that includes things in there. And then I went specifically to it. The curriculum includes firearms instructor manuals that FTLE puts out. You would agree with me on that? Yes. Have you reviewed those? Oh, I reviewed those. 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 is not out yet. Is it in there? No. You sure the word role playing in FDLE, the FDLE doesn't say it's okay? No! Because that would help them if FDLE doesn't approve it. Because they could look, even FDLE is afraid of these blanks. But I'm trying to show you, industry wise, blanks are used in law enforcement, in training, in demonstration. He doesn't have a thought going, okay, I should think that it's likely my officers are going to confuse bullets bring in wad cutters, aim a gun, that's the law. This right here, well, let me just, I don't, I don't want to leave this part out. This part right here, this part right here, ends this case. Ends this case. Because look what this requires. It says, the negligent act or omission. Now let's stop. What is the act or omission that they presented evidence that Tom Lewis did? We know Tom Lewis had done the shoot, don't shoot event before and had been successful. Okay? No problems. Why? Nobody's bringing in wad cutters and pointing guns at people and shooting them. Omission. What omission did he do? He delegates it to Katie Heck. And I submit to you this, and I submit to you for a lot of these witnesses this. Notice they called all these witnesses. They brought these witnesses, and they wanted to give you certain facts to say, hey, look, these are facts that we think support our case. And the minute I got up with them and would then say, well, wait a minute. 
that's not actually accurate what you said, or that's not actually accurate as to what happened, or it's not actually accurate there. And then they gave something that kind of showed or did show it really wasn't what the state was presenting that they tried to give you. And I'll give you a perfect example. Captain Jeff Woodard. When they said with Captain Jeff Woodard, they tried to pin him on some little line, and the question was horrible. It was a horrible question. Did you glean or know from the information as to when the implication was done of the event. I remember I read that to him out there. I read the whole sentence there. And I said, what did you think they were asking? And he said, I thought they were asking where I heard this from. Okay? So they used that one because it came the closest to sounding like, if you didn't take the context of it right, that somehow Tom Lewis went out there onto the internet and found something and implemented it, and somehow this is his, his creation. And yet, they knew that in the statement he gave before, and I read this, that's why I went over, well, you said before this. You said before this. I don't know how it came to be here. I know how I heard of it. I don't know who did it. I wasn't there at the meeting to implement. I don't know what the rules were. I don't know what this was. He gave that first. They didn't bring that up to him. They pulled one little thing out in the second interview, and then when he says to them, oh, that's not what I meant. Oh, well, you talked to Mr. Roman and drove to his office and went up there and talked to him. You know what? Here's the deal. This case is not going to be decided on whether these officers liked Chief Lewis. They obviously did. And that's not a bad thing for you to know. Okay? Because what they're saying is that this man over here did not care if anybody got hurt. But here's the thing. And the judge is going to read it to you in here. And all this talk about... Uh, talking to the lawyer and doing this. Just going to read to you. It is entirely proper for a lawyer to talk to a witness about what testimony the witness would give if called to the courtroom. It's what we do. The fact that my office is in Clearwater and a car pulls up with somebody, if that's going to be what changes the case, so be it. We already know they're friends. Uh, the witness should not be discredited by talking to a lawyer about his testimony. They have offices here. You heard how many, and you heard what happens when someone, that, when they say, hey, you come talk to us, what did you hear about that? Detective DeVault goes, I didn't want to do it. Hmm. No, I gave my statement. I didn't want to go talk to the state about this case. But what's he told? That we learned here, by the way. Because I got up and said, we well, voluntarily went there. I mean, you went to talk to them, but I never went to them. So we're going to have this issue about who's voluntary. We're both talking to witnesses. That's what lawyers do. What do you say? Well, they got up and said, after he gave the testimony that was good, that they thought, oh, it undermines what we just tried to do, now they want to go impeach him. Now they want to go say, oh, now don't, we call him to trust what he's going to say, but now don't trust him. And that's been kind of the theme the whole time here. They get the pieces they want to kind of pick and choose. I get up and put the full picture for you and say it was more than that. It was this. And then they get back up and go, oh, now you can't trust the person. You called them. You called the witness. You put them up on the stand to tell the jury, take what they're going to say and believe it. But don't believe it when it then puts it in perspective that it's not what we're saying it is. And that's happened here repeatedly. And with the vault, what did they do? You didn't want to be there. Boom, the bell's going, what? What do you mean you didn't want to be there? But you knew that because you talked to them. And what did he say? I don't want to be there. And then they said, your, your interim chief had to order you to be there. So another witness that you're going to hear from, who's supposed to be able to just give their testimony and not have a play in this and everything, orders a subordinate who has an absolute right to say, I don't want to talk to you voluntarily. The only time they're compelled to do it, and you've heard these days, were when they were in the depots or subpoenas. I, I, don't, I didn't subpoena Jeff Woodard and said, look, can you catch you right up here and I'll talk to you? I, I do want to know what you know about. And if there's a problem with that, I must not be very good at whatever is, is you know, kind of uh, nefarious about that because the bottom line is, is that Jeff Woodard and Chris Salzman have different testimony on some critical issues there, and I talked to both of them, okay? But that's their testimony. And that's okay. And so what happens here? So then every time somebody puts it in a bigger picture, and I don't believe them. Well, let's go through that issue here, because here's the bottom line. When I called, with, we, we could have gone to close in front of you when the state rested their case at that point, but I told you an opening about that Charlotte County incident. 
and I was going to bring those witnesses to you because I told you I'd do that. So I brought them to you. But they didn't prove anything beyond a reasonable doubt in their case in chief as to these elements. They didn't prove that Tom Lewis is the person beyond a reasonable doubt, that the only reasonable way this thing happened here is Tom Lewis exposed her to it. And let's just kind of close our ears about what Lee Cole did. Wrong. Not guilty is right there. But let's step to the next one. Because this is the one they can't get past. Can't get past this one. This one. Here's the definition. Here's the definition. And you'll get the instruction to read this. The negligent act or omission must have been committed with an utter disregard for the safety of others. Not an insufficient safety policy. Not a, hey, maybe this could have been better. Remember all that testimony for Sims where I basically said, well, any officer can work as a safety officer and check it. He said, yes. And then he goes, but I would prefer that it's somebody who's a certified this, that, and the other. And I said, well, that doesn't matter for looking at bullets. Well, you're right. Okay? So this doesn't say that you didn't do it. You did kind of a, not the best safety thing. Which, by the way, the system was set up to do safety checks because this whole time that they've been holding on to this thing about they want a designated safety officer. Uh, everybody ends up admitting, well, but we already know to do that. This is kind of like if two, two parents go out with a child, and they're both out there and they know they're responsible for it. It's inherent as a parent. It's inherent as law enforcement. What Gene Simpson, the first thing we do driving is safety. We all know that. In fact, if we talked about somebody being handed a gun in a case that did something weird about it or did something wrong with it, you surely know the state's going to go, it wasn't like there were a trained law enforcement officer handling the case which they keep trying to do towards Mary Knowlton. Except Mary Knowlton's gone. There is no question that all the checks were done. She's not the trained person. They did all that. They went over all that with her. Three levels. Woodard, uh, Duvall, and the chief loser doesn't have to do it, but still did it, right in front of everybody doing it. She's not the trained person. And so this idea of, well, you've got to put a civilian in here, it's not her gun that ended up causing an injury to her. Now, if you'd put a firearm in her hand that had a bullet in it, and you told her, okay, it's a real gun, and this, that, and the other, and something happened on her lack of experience to hurt herself or something, that's more in the range of what they're trying to argue these things, but that's not what happened. Her gun was vetted completely, and, and, and she used it properly. You'll look in the picture there. She's indexing with her finger. She's got her finger down the side of the gun for a proper index. Mary Knowlton's doing everything right. And all of this speculation about, oh, what happens if somebody turned and did that? None of that happened. None of that happened. And this thing about, well, she hadn't used a gun before. You heard the evidence. You heard the evidence. She didn't get a card original. And she went to an empty seat and checked where she was sitting, and they're like, oh, I do have the card. And then she's joking with Mr. Wright before him. Look what you got me into. And he's like, oh, go give him hell. Okay, this wasn't, oh, get me out of here and do this. And not that that should even matter, but when people come and argue this case that they put her in there, didn't know this, you're not taking all the evidence in there. She's like any other person. If they're uncomfortable, I choose not to do this. There's no obligation for anybody to do this. Yeah, I'm not real comfortable doing it. There was no, you have to do it. But here we go. Utter disregard, meaning none. None. I don't care about your safety. None. That's what culpable negligence is. None. Look at this. Culpable negligence is consciously doing an act. Consciously. I am choosing. Consciously. I'm not making a mistake. I'm not going because I've been chief five months, you know, and oh, it's an inexperienced, whatever. It's I'm choosing to do something. I'm choosing to do something. That I know, the defendant must have known or reasonably should have known. Okay, so they've got to have this intent. Was the characterization of the law, there's no intent element or anywhere in that instruction. Oh. Intent is your mind, obviously, and this is addressing what you know, it's your mind. Was likely to cause death or great bodily harm. You have to apply that law to these facts. 
Was it likely known to Chief Lewis that Lee Cole would go get log cutters and not read the box and not get it approved and not, and not uh, go and get proper policy vetting done? Was that likely known to him? No. No. Nobody said that. Nobody could say that. Was it likely known to him that when they get into it, that he is going to abandon the most primitive basics of firearm use and point it at her? Was it likely known he's going to do that? What evidence did they put on the stand before you to say, you know what? And I'll give you ways that somebody could have proved that if it existed. If it existed, anybody that's been a prosecutor knows if you're going to do a fact that way, then you can find if, the, if it's true. Okay, was there a meeting between Lee Cole and Tom Lewis where they go, hey, they discuss, let's make this real, real. What I want you to do is I want you to aim and get this isolese type of thing like this. And I want you to shoot it. Was there any evidence like that? No. Was there anything about somebody going, hey, you know, we're, gonna, we're filming this for some kind of a Hollywood uh, you know, TV reality show, so we're going to make it real done up, and we're going to break all the rules here, but don't worry, we're good, it'll be fine. No. How does Tom Lewis know it's likely that either of those two policy violations by Lee Cole is going to happen? So let's now go back to the back step of this. Their own expert admitted it. Uh, and so did Jim Nichols, who's been doing, who did a, a thousand of these with a blank gun that we could have fired a bullet. And here's the kind of um, red herring in all this from the state's theory. Nobody's thinking that it could be dangerous because you might substitute a wad gun. Okay, the, 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 the analysis we do of a gun is you might, if somebody confused, um, a bullet with a dome on it versus a flat top blank. That's the analysis that you do kind of stepping back just in general. And okay, we don't want that to happen. But I asked Mr. Sims that. Is it likely? Is it likely a trained law enforcement officer is going to not know why bullet from a blank? No. Did Tom Lewis the same thing right to the line? I don't expect anybody's going to confuse that. A trained law enforcement officer, frankly, the idea that a trained law enforcement officer would confuse a 38 live round with a dome on it, with a projectile, a piece of metal sitting on top, to know the bullet, what a bullet is, with a blank, uh, is like a pilot confusing a mountain for a runway. Do you need to sit around and have a policy going, now you understand runways are flat, and mountains are not. So don't drive the planet. No, it's inherent to the job. Again, how is Chief Lewis sitting there to know the events that, and you're not supposed to be determining the case on whatever other things in the world could possibly happen. You're the jury on this case, with these facts, with this evidence. And this evidence that's sitting here has nothing to show that any of the acts were likely to cause death or great bodily harm because he has a right to expect law enforcement to comply with their policies and the law. And everybody agreed with that. I mean, the idea that we think that a law enforcement officer would do something so outrageous that Lee Cole did is why, is why, The state attorney's office has charged him with manslaughter. So let's get this. Tom Lewis is supposed to know that setting up a shoot, don't shoot event that has been done safely before. That whether it's using simulation blanks or regular blanks, all of which are just noisemakers, all of which are regularly used, all of which the witnesses that know about firearms instruction testified, those can be used safely. They're used safely. None of which is being handed to Ms. Knowlton to even use. It's the trained officer's gun that went wrong here. Not the citizen. Not the inexperienced citizen. The citizen did nothing wrong. She did nothing wrong. The, the cancer in this case started with Katie Hepp, who is a 10-year officer. And I'm going to tell you something right now. These people saw this man's charge. 
on this idea that, well, you did not this and maybe the safety, that all these, this kind of like vague overview of charges here. You don't think for a half second that these people, Katie Heck, Jeff Woodard, that it, Jeff Woodard told you had a lawyer. You don't think it ran through their mind at all about what their role is? You're charging Chief Lewis who said, sure, let's do this. Here's the other thing. He invited people he knew. This is, this is kind of the idea that he is inviting people he knows to an event that's on video, that's got a photographer there shooting it, that's got 50 witnesses, because he knows, or should know, it's likely someone's going to die. That's what they have to prove. Look at this on, this on the instruction. On the instruction. Actual injury is not required. You know what that means? It means that he had to be a criminal before Mary Knowlton was ever hurt. That the event itself made him a criminal. Because that's what they keep saying, all the words these checks about. So the event's a criminal event. Really? The event's a criminal The one we've done before, no problem. The one the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office did two weeks before, and again, what did they allege? You're using a gun that can fire blanks. So did the Sheriff's Office two weeks before. I mean, they the warrants out for them now, go, well, you did it too. No! Of course not. Because what happened here is they went backwards. Somebody got hurt. So now they start going backwards and say, well, how can we show it? And if you think for a second that this doesn't have to do with the fact that he is the chief, the oh, no, we're just prosecuting the man, chief position, really nothing to do with it. Okay, well then explain to me why Katie Heck, who, who is a tenure officer, who, who started this, who has the bullets in her house, who has the box to read, who tells you, by the way, I don't know what grain means. She's a 10-year officer trained every year on firearm safety. She's a lieutenant in the command position. I don't know what grains mean. I didn't read it. I don't know. No, you know. And you know you just didn't do what you should have done. You know what you did was reckless. And you saw that your boss, who tasked you with putting this together, suddenly it's like, I didn't get any trick. I didn't know what I was doing. I'll bring my children to them. They're safe enough for them. But I didn't know if this was going to be safe. And then what happened? I had to pull like pulling teeth. I had to pull it out. And say, you set the person out. Would you at least agree with me on that? Yes. And you set four people on the shoot, don't shoot, right? Yes. And you just happened to set the training person that's in charge of doing safety checks? Well, no, no, I mean, so did you not want it to be safe? No, no, I did. I did want it to be safe. It's like pulling teeth. So you did take in consideration safety. Yes. You just didn't type at your computer, designated safety officer. Well, yes. But you knew it was going to be safe and they'd do the checks. Yes. What did Chris Soles would tell you? I was doing them. Until the guy who'd done them for five years and had more experience came to me and said, I'm going to go and take care of the Army and the weapons. Now again, this idea, there was no safe, they're already taking place. If you believe Jeff Woodard's testimony, he says he even went over to Chief Lewis and said, I'm going to go start doing the gun. So, so how in the world are we getting here going, Chief Lewis just didn't care if there's any safety things at all. We're just ignoring what really happened. People were doing the safety checks. Woodard goes through, he goes, and what, what did Lee Cole want to do? I mean, it's kind of consistent with everything else he's done. What, what do you want to do? I'll just take my hoodie. Don't worry, I don't have a mask. I'll just take the hoodie and wrap it up tight here. And Jeff Woodard goes, no, 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 no. You're not doing that. No. And he goes and he drives off scene to the storage place to get the masks for him. But we're not doing safety checks. He does this ammunition gun with the vault. We're not doing safety checks. Clears the gun, did all that tight. We're not doing safety checks. No, no, no safety. Chaos here. Chaos. Well, the chief's giving presentations. I mean, he can't do everything. He's got a right to delegate. He's got a right to trust these people in command level position to do their job. And it's not some just, well, he should have been doing it. He has a right to tell them to do their job and their right to do it. And so when you want to look at whether he's being persecuted or prosecuted because he's the chief, how is it that Katie Heck, they bring her up to you and go, well, and they try to, well, she didn't get in trouble. Like, that's supposed to alleviate your common sense about what's happened here. She gave the bullets. She didn't read the box. And then, 
30 some days later, when this incident happens, and everybody's like, how in the world? They can't wrap their heads around. How did Lee Cole put a mistake alive round, which they're thinking in the dome, for a blank? How did this happen? Okay, I didn't really think about it. You're 30 some days away from handing them stuff that you didn't know what it was, and you told them they were blanks. And I didn't, you know, so after Lee comes and talks to her. And what did she say at first? Oh, it was one blank. One box. One box. Okay? Did you requisition him any type of blanks for the department? Did you do that? I don't want to do that at all. No, I didn't do that. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing blanks. I, mean, I don't really do with that. Again, just like the itinerary, I, I just type stuff. I don't know anything. Okay? Who between Chief Lewis, who basically delegates for this to be run, been run successfully before, knows if the officers follow their policy, it will be safely done. Knows if anybody fires off a blank at the ground in two shots and makes the noise from a safe distance, da 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 that no one's going to get hurt from people he knows. Who, between Chief Lewis and Katie Heck, do you think would have a harder time getting past, did you do something reckless? Katie Heck's not charged. So what she said, so what happens then? So now they go back again after you, and you're like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Now I told you that, the agent did. Huh? No, no, no. We go pull this stuff. We're looking. This side the paper across. Sure didn't do a requisition? Oh, yeah, okay, I did. All right, I did a requisition. In February, March, April, May, June, July, August, six months before, they give him how many bullets? 150. Approved. No wad cutters. Nothing that's going to hurt Mary Knowlton. Chief Lewis signs off on it. Documents and evidence. You look at it. Signature, signature, signature. Effort clerk. Me. Special Super X blank rounds, 50 round box, same box you guys have in evidence as you can read that says do not point at a person or an animal. Requisition. Requested by Lee Cole. Please give me blanks that are approved and safe because I know that's the process we have to do. That's the rule and I will comply with it. Thank you. We will. Signatures, Lee Cole, Supervisor, Katie Hack, Chief of Police, Tom Lewis. Just use what they gave you. <coughs> you did that to Mary Dalton, not Chief Lewis. He gave you the proper stuff to use. And Katie Hack tries to deny all that. So then what do they have to do? They go fingerprint. The blazer box. They fingerprint the box. Yes, his finger was from the back. Katie Mandel, I don't know if that's Katie Heck. I mean, she's had these things, or at least, well, her print is on these things that her husband had, but she can't tell exactly how long they had. And he's in charge of the crime? He thinks it's likely that death is going to happen at the event that he invited people that he knows that he made it available for him at night because he knows some of them work in the day and it's community outreach. He's trying to do it. That's his intent. Look, look what. Here's the other thing you can look at clearly in the beginning of the instruction. The instruction tells you what culpable negligence is, which he didn't do. But the instruction also tells you. The instruction also tells you is. Hmm. If there's a violation of, of, of that duty, meaning acting reasonably towards each other, the violation of that duty, without any conscious intention to harm, that violation is negligence, which means it's not what? It's not culpable negligence. They've proven beyond a reasonable doubt to you that he had an intention to harm, 
or had been tempted so bad that he thought, hey, this is going to be, come on out, this is a production that's going to likely result in death or great bodily harm. something so stupid as to cause somebody I know to get hurt. This right here. What? This is not a Hollywood film. What is he doing this for? Look, look, look at this thing up here. And you see the he's backing up with it. You just have to do boom, boom, do fire to the ground. Tom Lewis somehow knew this was likely. Nobody knew this was likely. You know the other person that knew this was likely? Was Lee Cole, which is why the state attorney's office charged Lee Cole with manslaughter with a firearm. There is no policy or designated safety officer or anything else that's going to prevent somebody who chooses to commit a crime. There is no likelihood that a, a police chief has to think that an officer, the idea that we would think that law enforcement officers are likely to break the rules, they're the people we trust the most. Like, what do we call when we're in danger and need something? He knows, he knows they're trained better than we do. He knows how many training things they go through. That Treat all firearms if they're loaded. Treat all firearms if they're loaded. If you have a loaded firearm, you have a civilian there that you know is supposed to just be in a demonstration, is just going to do something with a paint gun that you're properly prepared for. Is he treating this gun as if it's loaded? No. If you treat it as loaded, you'd never do this. You'd never do this. Not to her. Not to her. Point the muzzle in a safe direction at all times. LC, Lee Cole. Sign at the bottom, Lee Cole. 318.14. Same document. Same two signatures. 
8.14.14. Same document. We're going to read with 3.5.15. Same document. 6.25.15. Likely to know that he's going to do something like this. It's absurd. It's absurd. But that's the law that they keep trying. That's the law they have to meet. That's their burden to do beyond a reasonable doubt. And you don't think there's a reasonable doubt that Chief Lewis reasonably may have expected his officers to not break the law? Because that's really what you'd have to find to find him guilty. We think that there is no reasonable doubt that Chief Lewis knew his officers were likely to break the law. Okay. I mean, you're the jerk. You know, you guys decide this. You heard the evidence of it. There's nothing to support that. There's not much more can be shown to you than that. What's been shown on here, you've heard from their own witnesses what he did was wrong. That's not something we're trying to displace blame. It's where the blame is. It's where it is. He, you removed two parts of this case. We're not here. Nobody did. She's alive. June to July, somewhere in there, on the July 4th, end of June, July. Katie had to clean out her garage. The demonstration is not really a garage, just represents it for my display here. There's some handoff with him out in the parking lot behind him. To Lee Cole. Katie Hack to Lee Cole. Hands his blazers to him. Not one box, two. He puts them in his guns. Violates. He has a policy there. Violates that all ammunition must be issued or approved by the department. They listen to this to do this. If they both do that, by the way, they both do that. This doesn't happen. Mary Knowles here. August 9, 2016. Points the gun at her. No question about that. Thank heavens there's a video. Thank heavens. Because Mr. Pryor, the guy they called, remember, that came up here and suddenly came up with, he gave a statement to Deputy Lee and said the chief came in and he looked, uh, he looked upset and he said the thing about, and he did look upset. He got other words, he looked ashen. Really, that's a guy that doesn't care what happened? Looks shocked. Clearly upset. And what does Mr. Pryor say? Oh, but, but, but now, when I met with the state, they brought up, hey, did he make some kind of statement about his fault or his responsibility? Yeah, they did. But, at first, but he just said it at first, remember? And I said, wait a minute, you didn't tell FDLE that. You didn't tell FDLE. No, no, I, well, when's the first time you said that? When I met with the state, how did you say that? How did you how did you now that long way remember this significant thing? I guess if he said something like that, and he said, "Well, they asked me if he said that, so they brought it up." And when I said to him, "Well, they brought it up," he said, "Well, no, no, hold on a second. I mean, I mean, it was brought up somehow, and this, that, blown. They brought it up, and you said, "Yes," yeah, because you're trying to help them." He's also the same guy that said, "Oh, Lee call a blow." Aimed low. Remember that? He aimed low. And I saw him take it out of his waistband. No, he didn't. And that's why it doesn't really matter on the issue of the case, but it does matter on how this case is being presented to you. They called him to the stand and said, and did you see anything in the Pontecona Police Department about anything in signs or something like that? And remember, I objected. And then they... they Put the evidence in front of him. He said, yes, what was it? I saw a sign that said it's the safest place in the city. Let me tell you what that is. That's this kind of sound bite testimony. That they kind of do that, that they want to do to compare the safest place in the city and then look what happened. Sound bite testimony. Okay? It has nothing to do with the case. They put it on the stand, they elicited it, and tried to tell it to you to try and set up this kind of little stuff. Look, it's so safe, but look what happened. Hoping somehow that affects what you do with him. And the truth ends up being, it doesn't say that at all. And you have this back there. There's a plaque right as you walk in that says, safe exchange place if you want to do something on Craigslist so nobody goes and robs you in a you know, Walmart parking lot when you're trying to exchange stuff. Why do I present that to you? Because when you pick and choose, pieces to do in a case, it's not fair. When you call witnesses to say things that aren't accurate or true, it's not fair. Now let me tell you something. It's in the lobby of the Pontecorda Police Department. How difficult
miracle if a witness tells them, safest place in the city, is it to go, hey, can you go out there and just make sure that sign's there, maybe get a picture for it for us, and da 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 No! We'll just say it. We'll just say it, even though this thing is sitting there for everybody to see, and go, that's not what it was, and yeah, we'll put it in front of the church. Isn't that right? And you can consider that in his testimony. Tom Moose is over here. You heard, it's at 1 in the morning. You heard also he was at the 8 o'clock, I guess, staff meeting. So anytime even before there, you guys can do the math. How long have you been there at that point? He's trying to give them everything he can at that point, what they're asking. They ask about the ball. They say the thing about who did it. It's a good question. Why is it a good question? Because by that time, things have been going on and people are doing it. Obviously, something happened wrong with Lee Cole's gun. And he can't be the investigator because he immediately said, get FDLE here. Because we can't be part of investigating. Get FDLE here. But that's a question of, well, who did look at this? Well, we know who was supposed to look at it, who undertook the whole role, Jeff Woodard. And when he got up there and said, yeah, I should have looked at it. And I'll tell you this about Jeff Woodard. And, and, and I disagree with the state all this stuff about what well, you could have told, you could have looked at. The only people that knew the intricacies of a wad cutter versus a blank were guys that were around 30, 40 years ago. Those are the only two people that said, I could recognize this here. When you're checking a bullet, you're looking for a projectile head. That's why he said, I would have seen it. And Jeff Woodard, of all witnesses there, even though he knows, yes, I should have done the last check. That was him, not Tom Woods. Even though he knows that I should have done the last check, you saw the effect on him that this case had. And that's not because he didn't care if anybody got hurt. Just like it's not because he didn't care if anybody got hurt. Jeff Ward did do that last check. Now, maybe he moved forward because of that rain coming. That could have been what, you know, let's hurry up, let's do this, the rain's coming, and he cuts, he cuts short. Tom Lewis has got an absolute right to think my five-year training officer that trains them four or five times a year on these safety issues will finish off doing the checks. The danger is that Lee Cole introduced something that defeated the safety check, and he wouldn't have caught it. He's not from that generation. We can sit all day with witnesses going, well, look how it's crypt here, and how this thing here, you can tell them that. They're going to look at it and go, there's no head on it. Guess who also missed it? The trainer at the, at the, at the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office. He said, I thought it was a blank. I looked at it as a blank. What I saw was a blank. But what did he say more importantly? Lee Cole said, I knew they weren't the he said, I knew they weren't the Winchesters, which is the only thing that the agency gave him. He says it was something different. And then he tries to tell the officer, the deputy, oh yeah, they're cheaper. They're cheaper. What is that about? They're cheaper, as if you have more knowledge about it, maybe. Did you look them up on the internet to buy them? Is there even more of something you should have picked up on? They're cheaper. And he fires to the ground. We're out at a picnic, and I put a cup on a picnic table, and it's kind of a breezy day. And we're all sitting there talking about life. And that cup, at some point, when the breeze comes through, slides across the table a little bit. None of us is going to go, did you see the cup slide across the table because of the wind? Because we all know it's windy. That's, yeah, okay. We blew the cup over. All right, fine. But if I put a cup in this courtroom, I sat down in front of the jury box there. And when I'm doing closing arguments, and we're talking, and we're doing this, and suddenly that cup goes like this. And we're going to go, did you see that cup just move? And the reason we're going to do it is because it's going to be unusual. It's going to be like, what in the world was that? Because the circumstances do not lead us to believe, or I understand exactly what it's a windy day at the picnic. No, it's like, there's no wind blowing through here. So when the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office guys are around and said and commented, the ground just moved. Well, the one guy said it went six to 12 inches. Did you see that? Yeah, I saw some code. Did you see that? I saw that. And Lee Cole standing right there. In their mind, because it's so absolutely unreasonable that somebody would have put a live bullet in a blank, they just can't wrap around. Are you shooting a bullet? So they're like, or maybe it was the gas of it or whatever. But as I believe as Gilmer said, no, he identified it. He identified the water cutter. Now, I said it was a blue top. When you look in the picture, it's a grayish color thing. And he's looking quickly at this. He didn't inspect it. And Lee Cole said they were different. 
It alarmed them in the sense that it brought their attention because it was unusual. And Lee Cole <coughs> knew it. And Lee Cole was there when they were in the group talking about it. He didn't do anything. How difficult is it for him just to read the box? Now, Negronelli, <coughs> how many bullets did he have left that the department gave him? 127 on the side. 127 decisions he could have made and nobody gets hurt. How many bullets did he originally have from Katie Head? Well, we testified that they didn't use them or they were just there, but we know that when we looked in the box, 25 of them used. We know four were fired off in this case. And when Chris Salzman cleared it, there was an empty chamber, which explained the click that the one guy heard because it was an empty chamber. We know he fired one in the ground. That's five. We know he did two scenarios where they said, I don't know how many he did, but he did multiple. He's got a five shot. And if he fired five shots, like he tried to fire five shots at Mary Knowlton, he would have fired ten shots that day. That's 15. There's ten other rounds he's firing. 25 opportunities for him to know I'm not firing blanks. And where did he fire at the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office? In the direction of an officer. Who was in front of who? The public. You know what the difference between the sheriff being looked at and Chief Lewis being looked at? Everybody got hit at the sheriff's. But the sheriff's fault? It's like it's not Chief Lewis's fault. Not under this law. This is a process. That's the proof. I've got an easier case to prove the case against him beyond a reasonable doubt than any case they have against Chief Lewis. Because they don't have a case against Chief Lewis. You didn't see one piece of evidence in this case, not one, where Chief Lewis was acting for anybody as if he didn't care what happened to him. Not one. They didn't present anybody to say that Chief Lewis did anything to not show any type of care about safety towards Mary Nolton. Look at this. A course of conduct showing reckless disregard for human life. A course of conduct. He set up an event. I delegated it to my lieutenant who's in charge of it. And by the way, all this stuff about Chief Arnell when it came in, the one part of the evidence that keeps forgetting me is the evidence was Chief Arnell brought it and he asked it to who? His lieutenant that's in charge of community services joking. Who's in charge of supposed to set it up? And all this. So Tom Lewis did this. Tom Lewis, Tom Lewis did what he was told to do with these things. Then he became chief. They continued this successfully. Until this. Let's go to Tom Lewis's statement. Then. Thank you now. And I want you to notice a couple things in it. You have any question about whether Tom Lewis had any type of um, intent or utter disregard or cared less if somebody got hurt? You know, when they interviewed him that night, you'll notice and he, that it's an evidence. He called her Mary. I'm saying that lady, I'm saying this woman, called her Mary. Doesn't say, eh, that's what happens. That something went horribly wrong. Nobody knows at that time what the pool's done yet. Katie Heck's the closest person that does. You know what that's what's kind of ironic. And when he comes to go to make the statement, to try and tell the community, basically, uh, I'm, I'm responsible for our officers. I'm accountable. Meaning, as you heard from our testimony, to pull out, you're going to get out DLE out here to find out what happened. We're going to find out what happened. We are going to find out what went or was wrong here. Just until that DLE. That they presented as if it's some kind of confession in this case. Which again, they choose. Call an expert who they let him see. You're, going to, you're getting an hour and 50 minutes worth of a whole thing where you're going to see all kinds of things on here. You're going to see on here things like, it's already in evidence, you're going to see things like at the 601-31 mark where uh, Lee, uh, Lee Cole's walking around talking to somebody and waving the gun around. You're going to see things on there about uh, at the um, let's see, 625 through 629 mark that uh, 
Jeff Woodard's out there having contact with Lee Cole going all over the stuff, and he ends up pulling his shirt off, and they're having this conversation about all these things involve safety things, exactly. The expert they bring you and show two minutes of that. They give them 30 pages out of 241. They gave them, what, six, seven statements in a case that you know there were at least 50 people, 45 people or something there that were interviewed that Negronelli talked about? What are you doing? You're going to testify and you're going to make this big grandiose statement here that you never should do this, even though he admits, so other okay and K9, and all 21 gun salutes are okay, but well, they are AR-15s. We can shoot an AR-15 with blanks and not, and that's okay. Okay. But somehow it's the, the fact that a gun that shoots blanks, and then he admits, well, but if it's used properly, yes. And if it had been used properly here, it would have happened. Okay. So people have kind of philosophical differences about blanks in general, but that's not what the law is likely to cause death or great bodily harm. He has to think that, know that, or should have known that. Which means he has to know people are going to break the law. They're going to commit manslaughter. It's kind of the irony of the position here. You know, they want to hold Tom Lewis account for exposure with the prosecuting the other guy for exposure for, a, for manslaughter, which, by the way, the evidence, and you'll see it, includes... Did unlawful, unlawfully by act, meaning like headed, or culpable negligence. So Tom Lewis's exposure supposedly is to contemplate other people's culpable negligence. I mean, you guys can go, you'll, you'll figure that, but it doesn't make any sense. He didn't do it. Five minutes, counsel. Thank you. There's no way I can possibly cover all the issues that create reasonable doubt in this case. I can't. I don't have enough time to do it. You heard the evidence here. I could, I could go on and do the hundred other things here. So I'm going to have to count on all of you to do that. Okay? You're back in the jury room. It's not about is it possible something could go on wrong. That is not the law. That is not the law. If that comes up, that's not the law. You have the law. Use it. Read it. Let me finish with this here. A reasonable doubt as to the guilt of a defendant may arise from the evidence, conflict in the evidence, or lack of evidence. The evidence. Lee Cole broke two policies. He did, not Tom Lewis. Tom Lewis had a right to expect Lee Cole wouldn't break any of those policies. Tom Lewis had a right to expect one of his commanders would not give somebody ammunition they didn't know what it was, and then tell them, oh, go use it. And what's he trying to say? Oh, but just for training. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so the lives of the officers you told them it's okay to use are okay if they die, but don't use it on any type of public demonstration. People's lives are lives. We all always talk about what lives matter. Everybody's life matters. You don't get to excuse yourself from your conduct by going, but I said training, as if shooting it around people trained to be law enforcement officers somehow is okay. It's not okay for anybody. You're not supposed to do it. That's why they have a rule in place. We approve it. He has a right to expect it gets approved. Lack of evidence. There is no evidence that he did not care less what happened to people that he knew. That's the standard. Even if you go, well, even if you thought that some part of this in your discussion, you go, well, this could have been better. Or you said, I think this part was negligent, but he really didn't intend to harm anybody. That's not guilty. That's not guilty. Or conflict in the evidence. There's a lot of conflict in the evidence. They bring on these witnesses to say something. They bring on see a sheen to go, oh, I didn't know anything. I didn't do this. You're the policy person with him. They're accredited, they're accredited in place. Someone's coming and looked at their policies, and he has a right to rely on his mind. Okay, our policies are fine. Someone's looked at them. This idea there's no policy about this event is a red herring. There is a huge policy about this event. It's what takes care of them at this event, at, at any other event, when they come in court, out of court, go anywhere, all those policies govern them and create it, make it safe. Use the only ammo we give. You don't point the gun at anybody. There's policy on this. You don't need to micromanage it down to what do we do in a parade? What do we do about if we go to a school for officer friendly? We have policies. Don't point the gun. Use our ammo. Be safe. Get it approved. And he has a right to rely on that. And so when you go back in closing, I'll tell you this, and the final thing I'll tell you on this case is this. 
You would have to believe that Tom Lewis didn't care what happened to those people, didn't care what happened to Ms. Knowlton. You'd have to believe they had no right to rely on his officers to do their job. You basically have to believe he predicted somebody committing a crime that they charged the other person with. So there's no dispute that that's what they think. That's not right. That's not right. He can't be convicted because he's a chief. The man is here. This man never did anything with the thought that someone's likely going to die at this event. And the evidence doesn't show anything, but he cared about what was going on there. And then criticized at the end all the things they want here, but none of it, none of it rises to the level of culpable negligence. It's wrong. It's wrong. A lot of other people they may have pointed a finger at, in this case, that you could argue that about, who aren't charged. But he shouldn't be the one doing that. He's not a criminal. He wasn't a criminal when he started it. He wasn't a criminal when this case started. He shouldn't be a criminal who walks out this door. And you guys are why we have a jury system. Because just because they say it doesn't mean it's accurate. You've heard the evidence. I'm asking you to go back there. I appreciate all your attention. I know it's been long. Tom Lewis is not guilty. And I should come back with a not guilty verdict. Thank you. Defense, you may proceed with rebuttal. I'm sorry, State. It's been long. <laughs> public relations were more important than public safety. And that's really what happened, and it's really what this case is about. Nobody is saying that Tom Lewis intended for Mary Knowlton to die. Okay? That's not what we're saying. That's not alleged. But this wasn't an accident. It was a series of outrageously reckless decisions, lack of judgment, and failures by Tom Lewis. It's not an accident. Not oops. Big tragic accident. Sorry it happened. We are here today because of his actions. This is not Lee Cole's trial today. We know the evidence against Lee Cole is bad too. That's not why we're here today. This was not a training exercise. It wasn't a canine demonstration. It wasn't a 21 gun salute. And it's not getting on an airplane either. This was purely entertainment and there was no point it was reckless a 73 year old woman goes to the police department and she gets killed by a police officer at the police department at Tom Lewis's police department think about that every single person in this courtroom when they first heard about this case when you sat on this jury and you heard the opening statement, you're probably thinking, how in the world could this have happened? How? And the only answer is completely, utterly, reckless disregard for the safety of other people, for Mary Knowlton and for anyone who was unlucky enough to have been put in her shoes that night. Completely reckless. No safety whatsoever. And that is criminal culpable negligence. That's what the evidence has shown us over the course of this week. Defense counsel just mentioned the long surveillance video. It was an hour and 54 minutes. We didn't play that entire video, so we didn't bore you to death uh, on Monday. If you look at that video, it is striking to see in that entire time period, from the time Lee Cole shows up in the Punta Gorda Police Department parking lot until the shooting of Mary Knowlton. There are no safety checks. Nothing. Nothing at all. A reasonable doubt. If you remember, we talked about this in jury selection. And this is when I was talking to some of you about that marathon example. The instruction looks like this. It won't have my highlighting on it. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt. Right? Remember we talked about the marathon, is it possible, is it reasonable, we talked about the difference. It is not a speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Reasonable doubt. 
not reasonable possibilities that defense counsel talked to you about last Friday evening. You've heard this argument throughout the trial that Officer Cole defeated all safety checks. Even if we had tried, we'd have never found those wad cutters in the revolver. That make any sense at all? Let's not even bother to have a safety officer. Let's not even bother to have someone check because nobody could have done it. We would need somebody that was around 30, 40 years ago. Let's not even try to have a safety officer. Why not a firearms instructor? Think that might be a good, a good idea. Lieutenant David Lipker was there that night. He was at the police department sitting in one of the buildings, not involved in the scenario at all. Maybe he would have been a good person to have checked. And remember Lieutenant Lipker's testimony. His testimony was actually, we don't need a safety officer. We've never had one. No one's ever talked about it. We don't need one. We're all safety officers. That's the way this is supposed to work. You're going to use a real gun and have a 73-year-old woman walking between two cars with someone shooting near her, and you don't think we should double-check the ammo? The easiest way to ensure that this never happens is obvious, right? Don't use a real gun. We used to use simunitions weapons, but they weren't loud enough when the participants had their helmets on, those protective helmets, because even simunitions weapons, even those pellets can be dangerous. Remember, that's why Officer Cole had the helmet on, Officer Chodkowski had a helmet. Even those are dangerous, but they weren't loud enough. And you remember Tom Lewis's statement? We made the transition some time ago to make it more realistic. We wanted a louder bang. We wanted to have more of an impact. Is that a safety decision? We could use a safe simunitions weapon with protective gear on Mary Knowlton. But instead of doing that, the safe thing, we're going we're to make more of an impact. Let's use blank rounds, and no one will check them. That's not a safety decision. That is utter disregard for the safety of the public, for people you're walking into that scenario. When you stand there and you watch her walk into that, you know this is the way it's supposed to work. Don't use a gun. Never happens. It's pointless. Another way to make sure this never happens if you are going to use a gun, which is ill-advised, control the ammo. Make sure whatever your officer is going to use comes from the armory. Remember the testimony of the armory is about the size of this jury box and some munitions weapons are held there, some munitions ammo are held there, some other guns? Make sure it's coming out of there. Only select people have access to that armory. Put your firearms instructors in charge of that. Make Lee Cole check out the weapon that's going to be used. That way you've got a double check on it. It's already checked before he ever gets it. But no! What do they do here? What does Tom Lewis do here? Lee's got that K9 gun. Let him let's use that. Bring in his own ammo. Bring in your own gun. Hopefully someone checks it, or we hope you get it right. We'll just trust Officer Cole to get this right. In a scenario where he's going to be shooting near somebody, you could have someone read the box before they give them the ammo. You can look at the boxes themselves. They're in evidence. You can look at the photos. I know you've seen them. There are warnings all over those boxes. Blank. Blank. Do not point at anyone. Do not fire. Blanks are dangerous. Blanks are dangerous. Have someone else give the ammo out. You've got a built-in safety check. Compare all the safety checks that some of the other officers talked about in different scenarios. Not in the shoot, don't shoot, had no safety. But think about what they do in SWAT team training. Remember Officer Angelini testified pretty early in the trial. He was one of the first officers to testify. And he talked about what they do at SWAT training. They come into a designated area. They are patted down by a person. A designated person pats them down to make sure they don't have outside guns, outside ammo, a knife, anything. Right? It makes sense. It's common sense. Why wouldn't you do that? You control it. Everyone lines up. They check their gun. They check their neighbor's gun next to them if they're at the range, shooting down the range. 
And then there is a safety officer on the left side and a safety officer on the right side. And they go down the rows, checking everyone's guns and ammo, and then they cross over each other and they keep going down. Two designated safety officers. Check your gun, check your neighbor's gun. You have like four checks and a pat down before anyone's firing a weapon. They do all of that for officers. You have Gene Sims at the Southwest Florida Police Academy. He was talked about how uh, he talked about how new cadets and people for advanced training, what they go through as far as safety procedures. The primary rule with firearms is safety. Above all else, that is the only thing that matters. Everyone is checked when they come in. Their guns are checked. The firearms uh, instructor or trainer is in charge. He or she is the leader. There is a person designated for safety. And it's important to do that. So you don't have deaths like you see in this video. Guns are dangerous. It's silly to say. It's common sense. You have to take safety precautions. You heard from the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office canine unit, most of them. Guns are checked. They're double checked. Lenny Trevette loads our weapons. The guns are never shot at, near, towards, pointed at, ever with civilians. It's crazy. Why would you do that? Safety is always paramount. So control the situation. Make it safe. That is the primary rule of firearm safety. You don't make exceptions for blanks. Oh, blanks aren't that dangerous. No, they are. There are no exceptions. That is an utter disregard for safety when you put this scenario into place. You're going to, Ms. Russell talked a little bit about how you should weigh the evidence. And we talked about, in jury selection last Friday, we talked about how you can believe, you're the fact finders, obviously. You can believe all of what a witness says, some of it, none of it, bits and pieces. And we talked about that scenario where you may go into another room and maybe your kids are in a fight or an argument or they broke something, you gotta figure out what happened. You weren't there to see it. So what do you do? Right? The kids are doing this. It's his fault, it's her fault, right? What do you do? You have to weigh the evidence. You have to consider what they say. And I highlighted a few things that I think are especially important in this case. When you consider the testimony of the PGPD officers that worked for Tom Lewis and testified against him in this case, was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? Did the witness have an interest in how the outcome of the case should be decided? How they want you to decide this case? Does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony? Does their testimony match up with the videos, with the photos, with what other people say? Did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with their in-court testimony? So, again, you can use your common sense and think about the testimony of a couple of important witnesses. Jeff Woodard and Lieutenant Chris Salzman. Jeff Woodard is formerly the captain of operations with PGPD. He's the number two or perhaps the number three ranking officer below Tom Lewis. Lieutenant Salzman is another high-ranking officer with Punta Gorda Police Department. Both of these witnesses gave damaging testimony to Tom Lewis. They are friends, they are close, and their testimony is not good for him. So what do they do? They go to Tom Lewis's defense attorney's office before the trial. Tom Lewis has the idea, picks them up on different days, he picks Jeff Woodard up, drives him to Clearwater to talk about his statement. Four days after Jeff Woodard has resigned from the Punta Gorda Police Department, the day before he was scheduled to give sworn testimony under oath in a deposition with Lee Cole's attorney. The day before, Tom Lewis, the chief of police, is picking up state's witnesses and driving them to clear water. And do you remember the questions that were asked of both Jeff Woodard and Lieutenant Salzman? You guys are friends, of course, yeah. They gave you that. 
what did you talk about on the way up there? Oh, just about life. Did you talk about the facts of the case, like why you were going to talk to his attorney? No. Do you, do you believe that? Two hours up, two hours back, in the car with Tom Lewis, you don't think they talked about their testimony, what the defense was going to be in the case? That is wholly unbelievable. They've seen the reports, the statements, the photos, all of the evidence. They've talked to Tom Lewis many times before this case. And remember the testimony? Everybody at PG&P is talking about this. This is a big deal in a small department. So everyone is talking about it. And that's understandable. But you need to consider that when you're deciding what parts of their testimony you can believe and what you don't believe. Why do you think Lieutenant Salzman tried so hard to change his testimony? How was the scenario supposed to work? Lee Cole was supposed to pick up the gun off the hood of the car and then point it downward and fire it. That's what he said on the stand the other day. And you remember when I asked him, what about the statement you first gave on August 10th when it first happened? and you are sworn under oath to tell the truth, the same oath you took in this courtroom, how, he, he was asked by Special Agent Ortiz, how was the scenario supposed to play out? And he said almost the same things all along, until Lee Cole is supposed to pick up the gun, direct it in her direction, point it at her. And you remember, I, I read it to him, and he said, well, let me, let me clarify. It was a really long day, and um, I, I may have not meant that. Do you believe that? Do you believe that testimony when he's in a car going up? He knows how damaging those words are. He knows that's an important issue in this case. He knows that's how the shoot-don't shoot is supposed to work. So can you believe him when he says that? And that's why we talked about you can believe bits and pieces of what the witnesses say. And I would submit that there are bits and pieces that are important. Some of the most important questions in this trial, Jeff Woodard and Chris Salzman were evasive. At best, you can say they were evasive. So you need to consider what you find to be credible. You have heard it's Katie Heck's fault. It's Salzman's fault. It's Woodard's fault. Not my fault, though. Not my fault. Mary Knowlton was killed. She was exposed to personal injury. Tom Lewis is the chief of police. He is the head of the agency. He was the person in charge that night. He was involved in every single stage. And you have the photos that show you that. He's at the welcome. He's at the tour. He led a tour group. He's at the static display. He's the closest person to Mary Knowlton. He's the last check on her gun. He's involved in every step of the way. He is not guilty because of his title. He's not charged simply because he's the chief of police. It's a piece of evidence. It's not the end-all, be-all. He is guilty because of his actions, not because of his title. He's a firearms instructor. He's been an officer for 15 plus years. He is trained in how to handle firearms safely. He knows as much or more than anybody at that department how dangerous firearms are. Why would you use a firearm? There is no excuse for it. There's no reason. They are so dangerous. And when you introduce a live firearm into the shooting scenario, they're not toys. They're not to be played with. You just don't need to use a real gun. Now, the statement he made in front of the public I am, one, uh, I am responsible for the actions of my officers. I am 100% accountable. We are not telling you that that is a confession to a crime. It's a piece of evidence, and you can decide what weight to give that to you. We talked in jury selection that everybody must be held accountable for their actions. Everyone is responsible for what they do, and we agreed that nobody is above the law, and the law should apply equally to everyone. Tom Lewis planned the event. 
A lot of witnesses came up and tried to say that Katie Heck was actually in charge. Katie Heck did all. Katie Heck did That's impossible. Okay? That makes no sense whatsoever. Katie Heck was not even there that night. She sent out an email with a schedule, and that states 114, that little itinerary of the layout of the times and what would happen next. She sent an email out, something that they've had in their shared drive on their computers for years. She adopted it from someone else and sent it out, and that was her involvement that night. She's seen the shoot, don't shoot one time. She wasn't there. She doesn't really know a whole lot about guns, obviously. Obviously, she doesn't know a thing about shoot, don't shoot. She wasn't there. She's not in charge. You can't blame her for the shoot, don't shoot scenario as far as being there. She's not a safety officer. She's not assigning a safety officer. Tom Lewis was there. He was in charge. He was there at every single stage. He was involved. He assigned the roles. Do you remember the staff meeting? The, the testimony showed that he held that morning. It's a normal staff meeting. They talk about what happened the night before, what's coming up. And they talked about the scenario coming up that night. Lieutenant Salzman was there, Captain Woodard, Captain Chastini, all the high-ranking officials. And with the exception of Katie Heck, all of those officials were, were at the event that night. There was only this one scenario with shooting. It was not impossible to supervise or to make sure that it was safe. There was only one single scenario where someone would be using a firearm. You don't need a safety officer for the bike display or the marine unit or anything like that. Just this one person with lethal ammunition, with a, leth with a gun that's capable of firing lethal ammunition. Reckless, careless, no safety precautions. Tom Lewis is the person that authorized the shoot, don't shoot scenario. He was involved when it first came into the Punta Gorda Police Department. This was his scenario. It started when he was captain of operations, and then this became a thing at the Punta Gorda Police Department. And he's been involved in all of it. Worked the same way every time. Those were his words in that statement. That night, he told Lieutenant Woodard, he was giving directions, he told Lieutenant Woodard, excuse me, Captain Woodard, where are my participants? Because remember he came in, he said, Chief, the rain's coming in, do you want to speed this up? Yes, keep us on time. Woodard wasn't even supposed to be there that night. He wasn't assigned to this, that's why you don't see him on the outline. He was told to be there by Tom Lewis. He came there and came, went to the Chief. You want me to keep this moving? Yes, go get my role players, let's get going. Do you want me to prepare this ammunition's weapon? Yes. So he goes into the armory. He was told to do this by Tom Lewis. He goes, meets with Detective DeVault, has Detective DeVault check the ammunition's weapons. These are the, the less dangerous ammunition. And we have a check, a double check, and then when they bring her out and they give it to Tom Lewis, a triple check. So you have all of these precautions for the ammunition's weapon. And we know. There was none on the dangerous weapon. Tom Lewis was involved in the creation of this scenario, the planning, it coming to the Punta Gorda Police Department, and he had no written procedures, no safety procedures at all. There was no direction as to anything regarding safety on that live firearm. There were no scripts, you're supposed to do this. There was no, uh, do, do this, don't do that. Jeff Woodard, you're the handler, you need to be closer to her than 30 feet away on the other side of the parking lot. There was nothing like that. The members of the chamber didn't even know that Officer Cole was gonna have a gun. You remember that testimony? Like three or four people came up here and said, we didn't even know there was gonna be a gun. No one told us that. How are you volunteering for something how can you be that close to a live firearm and no one even tells you? Is that a safety measure that Tom Lewis took? It was supposed to be a surprise. You're going to have a 73-year-old woman standing between a car and surprise, we're going to fire a real firearm in your direction, near you, towards you. Doesn't matter. That's what Officer Cole was supposed to do in that scenario. That's how it was designed to work. 
And again, there are no exceptions for blanks. You don't, there's no exception for a shoot, don't shoot scenario. Number one rule, you don't point a firearm at anyone you're not intending to kill. It's not, well, blanks are safe, so we can do it with blanks. No. It's not, well, we're trying to do an entertainment exercise for the public. No. That's not how it's supposed to work. There are no exceptions to that rule. This decision, everything surrounding it is careless, it is utterly reckless, it is grossly negligent, and that's why it rises to the level of criminal culpable negligence. Jeff Woodard testified, no one had ever talked about a safety officer before. When we've done this shoot, don't shoot scenario, we've never had one. Never even thought of it. Tom Lewis, who installed this, never thought we should have anyone double check. We'll just hope they do it. Cross your fingers, hope Lee Cole gets it right. They never even considered it. And that's why you have all of these biased officers, all of these witnesses that have an interest in the outcome of the case, come up here and try to convince you we're all safety officers. That's good enough. Oops, big tragic accident this one time. That's not good enough. Last thing I want to point out is that they do all of these safety measures for officer Cole's protection. We talk about single, double, triple check on the simunitions weapon. We make sure that Officer Cole has a helmet that he's covered from head to toe because the simunitions weapons, uh, ammunition can be dangerous. They don't do anything for Mary Knowlton. They don't give her a helmet. Officer Chodakowski is not even involved. He's, got, he's holding a helmet. They don't give her a helmet. They don't give her any bulletproof vest. Nothing. Let's just walk her out there. It was so incredibly careless. There was no regard for her safety whatsoever at all. And it was Tom Lewis's design, his plan, his scenario. The safety rules are not different for law enforcement officers or for throwing a civilian into a shoot and don't shoot scenario, and they shouldn't be. When you put all of these facts together, this Tom Lewis knew, or he reasonably should have known, that there was a likelihood of great bodily harm or death. When you're introducing a live firearm and you have no checks whatsoever, that's culpable negligence. And I will finish by saying this. No one here is trying to say that Tom Lewis, the chief of police, is a bad guy. Nobody is saying He's a monster. We're not. That has nothing to do with your decision making. You are not judging him or his character. You don't have to decide today whether you think he's a good guy or a bad guy. That's not what you're here for. We talked in jury selection. Again, nobody is above the law. Everybody must be held accountable. And your job is to decide whether the evidence proves the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. Remember that it is only about the law and the evidence in this case, and that's what you're to base your decision on. I would submit to you that the evidence is here. We have proven the case. The evidence is overwhelming to show gross, reckless, flagrant disregard for the safety of others. There's a course of conduct showing the recklessness. The evidence shows us that the defendant is guilty, and the state is asking you to return a verdict of guilty. Thank you for your time and your attention. Members of the jury, I thank you for your attention during this trial. Please pay attention to the instructions I am about to give you. These will go back with you as well during your deliberation, so no need to write anything down. Thomas Lewis, the defendant in this case, has been accused of the crime of culpable negligence. To prove the crime of culpable negligence, the state must prove the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, Thomas Lewis exposed Mary Knowlton to personal injury. And two, he did so through culpable negligence. Actual injury is not required. I will now define culpable negligence for you. 
each of us has a duty to act reasonably toward others. If there is a violation of that duty without any conscious intention to harm, that violation is negligence. But culpable negligence is more than a failure to use ordinary care for others. In order for negligence to be culpable, it must be gross and flagrant. Culpable negligence is a course of conduct showing reckless disregard for human life or for the safety of persons exposed to its dangerous effects or such an entire want of care as to raise a presumption of a conscious indifference to consequences or which shows wantonness or recklessness or a grossly careless disregard for the safety and welfare of the public, or shows such an indifference to the rights of others as is equivalent to an intentional violation of such rights. The negligent act or omission must have been committed with an other, utter disregard for the safety of others. Culpable negligence is consciously doing an act or following a course of conduct that the defendant must have known or reasonably should have known was likely to cause death or great bodily injury. The defendant has entered a plea of not guilty. This means you must presume or believe the defendant is innocent. The presumption stays with the defendant as to each material allegation in the information through each stage of the trial unless it has been overcome by the evidence to the exclusion of and beyond a reasonable doubt. To overcome the defendant's presumption of innocence, the state has the burden of proving the crime with, with which the defendant is charged was committed and the defendant is the person who committed the crime. The defendant is not required to present evidence or prove anything. Whenever the words reasonable doubt are used, you must consider the following. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt, a speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty if you have an abiding conviction of guilt. On the other hand, if after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all the evidence, there is not an abiding conviction of guilt, or if having a con conviction, it is one which is not stable, but one which wavers and vacillates, then the charge is not proved beyond every reasonable doubt, and you must find the defendant not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. It is to the evidence introduced in this trial and to it alone that you are to look for that proof. A reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the defendant may arise from the evidence, a conflict in the evidence, or lack of evidence. If you have a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant not guilty. If you have no reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty. It is up to you to decide what evidence is reliable. Use common sense in deciding which is the best evidence and which evidence should not be relied upon in considering your verdict. You may find some of the evidence not reliable or less reliable than other evidence. You should consider how the witnesses acted as well as what they said. Some things you should consider are, one, did the witness seem to have an opportunity to see and know the things about which the witness testified? Two, did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Three, was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's question? Four, did the witness have some interest in how the case should be decided? Five, does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence in the case? Six, has the witness been offered or received any money, preferred treatment, or other benefit in order to get the witness to testify? Seven, had any pressure or threat been used against the witness that affected the truth of the witness's testimony? Eight, did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he or she gave in court? Whether the state has met its burden of proof does not depend upon the number of witnesses it has called or upon the number of exhibits it has offered, but instead upon the nature and quality of the evidence presented. The fact that a witness is employed in law enforcement does not mean that his or her testimony deserves more or less consideration than that of any other witnesses. Expert witnesses are like other witnesses with one exception. The law permits an expert witness to give his opinion. However, an expert's opinion is reliable only when given on a subject about which you believe him to be an expert. Like other witnesses, you may believe or disbelieve all or any part of an expert's testimony. It is entirely proper for a lawyer to talk to a witness about what testimony the witness would give if called to the courtroom. The witness should not be discredited by talking to a lawyer about his testimony. You may rely upon your own conclusions about the credibility of any witness. 
a juror may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the evidence or the testimony of any witness. The Constitution requires the state to prove its accusations against the defendant. It is not necessary for the defendant to disprove anything, nor is the defendant required to prove his innocence. It is up to the state to prove the defendant's guilt by evidence. The defendant exercised a fundamental right by choosing not to be a witness in this case. You must not view this as an admission of guilt or be influenced in any way by that decision. No juror should ever be concerned that the defendant did or did not take the witness stand to give testimony in the case. A statement claimed to have been made by the defendant outside of court has been placed before you. Such a statement should always be considered with caution and be weighed with great care to make certain it was freely and voluntarily made. Therefore, you must determine from the evidence that the defendant's alleged statement was knowingly, voluntarily, and freely made. In making this determination, you should consider the total circumstances, including but not limited to, one, whether when the defendant made the statement, he had been threatened in order to get him to make it, and two, whether anyone had promised him anything in order to get him to make it. If you conclude the defendant's out-of-court statement was not freely and voluntarily made, you should disregard it. You have heard testimony of eyewitness identification. In deciding how much weight to give this testimony, you may consider various factors mentioned in these instructions concerning the credibility of witnesses. In addition to those factors, in evaluating eyewitness identification testimony, you may also consider, one, the capacity and opportunity of the eyewitness to observe the offender based upon the length of time for observation and the conditions at the time of observation, including lighting and distance, two, whether the identification was the product of the eyewitness's own recollection or was the result of influence or suggestiveness, three, the circumstances under which the defendant was presented to the eyewitness for identification, four, any inconsistent identifications made by the eyewitness, five, any instance in which the eyewitness did not make an identification when given the opportunity to do so, six, the witness's familiarity with the subject identified, seven, lapses of time between the event and the identification, eight, whether the eyewitness and the offender are of, are of different races or ethnic groups and whether this may have affected the accuracy of the identification, nine, the totality of the circumstances surrounding the eyewitness's identification. These are some general rules that apply to your discussions. You must follow these rules in order to return a lawful verdict. One, you must follow the law as it is set out in these instructions. If you fail to follow the law, your verdict will be a miscarriage of justice. There is no reason for failing to follow the law in this case. All of us are depending on you to make a wise and legal decision in this matter. Two, the case must be decided only upon the evidence that you have heard from the testimony of the witnesses and have seen in the form of the exhibits and evidence in these instructions. Three, this case must not be decided for or against anyone because you feel sorry for anyone or are angry at anyone. Four, remember the lawyers are not on trial. Your feelings about them should not influence your decision in this case. Five, whatever verdict you render must be unanimous. That is, each juror must agree to the same verdict. Six, your verdict should not be influenced by feelings of prejudice, bias, or sympathy. Your verdict must be based on the evidence and on the law contained in these instructions. Deciding a verdict is exclusively your job. I cannot participate in that decision in any way. Please disregard anything that I may have said or done that made you think I preferred one verdict over another. You may find the defendant guilty as charged in the information or not guilty. If you return a verdict of guilty, it should be for the highest offense which has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. If you find that no offense has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then of course your verdict must be not guilty. The verdict must be unanimous. Again, that is, all of you must agree to the same verdict. <coughs> Excuse me. Only one verdict may be returned as to the crime. The verdict must be in writing, and for your convenience, the necessary verdict form has been prepared for you. I don't expect you to be able to see this, but it will go back with you. It reads, State of Florida v. Thomas Lewis, verdict. We, the jury, find as follows as to the defendant in this case. 
A, the defendant is guilty of culpable negligence, or B, the defendant is not guilty. So say we all, there'll be a date, and <clears throat> the poor person will sign it and print their names, and you will check either A or B. It will only be one that's to be checked. In just a few moments, you will be taken to the jury room by the bailiff. The first thing you should do is choose a four person who will preside over your deliberation. The four person should see to it that your discussions are carried on in an organized way and that everyone has a fair chance to be heard. It is also the four person's job to sign and date the verdict form as we discussed <clears throat> and to bring the verdict form back into the courtroom when you return. During deliberations, jurors must communicate about the case only with one another and only when all jurors are present in the jury room. You are not to communicate with any person outside the jury about this case. Until you have reached a verdict, you must not talk about this case in person or through the telephone, writing, or electronic communication such as blog, Twitter, email, text message, or any other means. Do not contact anyone to assist you during your deliberations. These communications rules apply until I discharge you at the end of the case. If you become aware of any violations of these instructions or any other instructions I've given you during this case, you must tell me by giving a note to the bailiff. Many of you have cell phones or other electronic devices here in the courtroom. The rules do not allow you to bring the, any type of those electronic devices into the jury room. What I'm going to ask you to do is the bailiff will collect those for you and they will be put in a locker in a safe place. Make sure they're powered off so that they're not going off in the locker. When you're done with deliberations, you will get those um, electronic devices back to you. If you need to communicate with me, send a note through the bailiff signed by the four person. If you have reached a decision or voted, do not disclose the actual vote in the note. If you have questions, I will talk to the attorneys before I answer it, so it may take some time. You may continue your deliberations while you wait for my answer. I will answer any questions I can in writing or orally here in open court if, you, if that's necessary. During the trial, items were received into evidence as exhibits. You may examine whatever exhibits you think will help you in your del deliberations. Some of the exhibits will be sent in the, into the jury room with you when you begin to deliberate. If you wish to see any other exhibits that cannot be sent back, please request that in writing. We don't have the capability of sending the videos back with you or the audio. If you wish to see anything or hear anything, give a note to the bailiff and we will set it up here in court for you to come back in court. Likewise, ammunition can co cannot go back to the jury room with you. There's photographs, but if you'd like to see any of the actual ammunition, give a note in writing and we'll bring you back to do so. In closing, let me remind you that it is important that you follow the law spelled out in these instructions in deciding your verdict. There are no, <clears throat> excuse me, there are no other laws that apply to this case. Even if you do not like the laws that must be applied, you must use them. For two centuries, we have lived by the Constitution and the law, and no juror has a right to violate the rules we all share. Any objections to the instructions as read? All right, and does the clerk have all items of exhibits? All right, make sure she gets those. Ladies and gentlemen, once we get all the exhibits <clears throat> that we are allowed to go back with you, we will send you back. Miss Esther Downs, I'm going to ask that you stay put while everybody goes back. <clears throat> Do you have anything, Miss Downs, in the jury room that needs to be gathered? Okay, we'll make sure. <clears throat> Do we have all the exhibit that can go back? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are now excused to begin your deliberations. Grab your booklet. We're going to take our booklets this time. Your drinks. And I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. All right. Can you bring your drink? I'll bring my drink. Perfect. We got our booklet. We got. Drink. Okay. 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 Okay.
All right, you may be seated. Ms. Downs, you are not in any trouble, and I know this, especially after a long trial, it's always hard to tell you that you were selected as our alternate juror. Um, the reason that we do that, obviously, in a lengthy trial, if something happens with somebody, we need to have a jury of six. So since nothing happened to the other six, we release you at this time. You have the absolute right to stay. You have the absolute right to leave. You have the absolute right to refuse any questions if anybody wants uh, to ask you questions, or you have the right to talk to anybody that you wish to talk to. But from now, I want to thank you very much. I, it has been a long time since last Friday. I know on behalf of the defense and the state and myself, we really thank you for your time and attention. And our system does not work without people coming in. So thank you very much. I'll let you discuss with the bailiff. They're going to grab your personal belongings. If you want, if you do want to leave, they'll escort you the way that you've been coming in. So thank you very much. I'll wait for your stuff, though. Are you, are you um, going to, okay, are you going to leave me? Okay, you can just go, they take you back there. You okay. go ahead and go back. I got my phone. Oh, okay, perfect. Oops. All right, thank you very much, ma'am. <laughs> Court is in recess. Um, I would just suggest if you do go anywhere, just uh, will you take cell phones? Yeah. Give your cell phones to the clerk and she'll notify you. Okay, great. Thank you. Court is in recess.